So today I'm going to talk about a, a magnetotelluric experiment that we ran a few years back in the Washington Cascades um, and some of the implications it has for understanding the magmatic system that drives Mount St. Helens. And I want to you know, emphasize up front that this work was uh, a large collaboration, a uh, collaboration between myself and Jared Peacock at the USGS, uh, Adam Schultz and Esteban Bowles Martinez at Oregon State, uh, and Graham Hill, who's now at the uh, Czech Academy of Sciences, as well as a, a large host of uh, you know, characters who helped in various uh, parts of this along the way. So I'm gonna start a little bit uh, with a roadmap here. I'll talk a little bit about kind of our changing views of magmatic systems. Um, I'll then uh, give a bit of an introduction to the Cascades Magmatic Arc and some of the problems and outstanding issues with St. Helens. Uh, I'll introduce the uh, IMUSH experiment. This is imaging magma under Mount St. Helens. And I'm gonna really be focusing on the magnetotelluric component of it and some of the uh, interpretations that are coming out of our resistivity model. And then I'll finish with a few closing thoughts on kind of the importance perhaps of lateral transport and inherited structure in relation to the ascent and storage of magma. So I think a fitting place to begin is with the concept of the magma chamber. And uh, this is uh, perhaps shown here, one of the uh, earliest views of it from by uh, Athanasius Kircher from oh, 60, mid 1600s from based on looking into the crater of Vesuvius. But I think it captures kind of this idea that for the longest time, magma in the earth was really taken to reside in sort of these neat and tidy magma chambers, which were kind of pools of convecting melt churning and differentiating deep in the crust and with a usually a vertical conduit connecting it to the volcanoes at the surface. And so this view kind of prevailed for more than three centuries and in some ways really didn't change much along the way. But really over the past several decades, there's been a, a, a wide uh, body of geophysical, geochemical, volcanological, petrological observations that have kind of broken this down, this simplistic view down into a much more rich, complex and uh, nuanced view. And so this is really kind of summarized in sort of what's been termed the transcrustal magmatic system. Um, and shown here on the right is an image from a review paper by Kathy Cashman. And we've come to understand that magma in the, in the earth is really distributed in sort of a complex and vertically extensive uh, uh, domain. And that there's a number of important factors, but that recognizing that there are varying rates for melt generation, melt compaction and segregation, the ascent of melts through the crustal column and its accumulation and in some cases, ultimate release. And that these timescales vary by many orders of magnitude. It's also increasingly recognized when we consider these systems from kind of a heat transfer perspective that much of a magma system's life is actually spent in a highly crystalline state. And this is important for geophysical imaging because in particular, when looking at MT, we require a connected and interconnected conductive phase. And if magma is largely crystalline, you may not have that in many cases. And kind of in tandem with that is that within the upper crust, it's recognized that large melt rich bodies are actually rather uncommon and they tend to be ephemeral in the greater geologic time scale. And a final, I wanted to point out that uh, most of the models that are still used assume a bit of a bottom up approach in that melt emerges in volcanoes pretty much in the same vertical plane from where it's generated down deep in the mantle. And that's something we'll look at a little bit here. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the evidence that we do have for lateral transport of magma on a variety of time and spatial scales. Um, so here's an example from uh, Chaitan volcano in Chile in which uh, deformation monitoring was able to show that over the course of the eruptive sequence that you had a propagation of melts over both lateral and vertical distances of you know, tens of kilometers. So that's on a relatively short time scale. We also understand that there is considerable interconnectivity between individual volcanic centers. This is an example from uh, Kirishima uh, in Japan, where again, using sort of deformation monitoring, they've been able to argue that there is a connectivity between these different edifices deep in the crust. And perhaps the poster child for this would be um, in the Katmai volcanic group in Alaska, where during the 1912 eruption, uh, you had 
eruptive material venting from Nova Rupta at the same time as the summit area of Mount Katmai nearby was collapsing. And there's similar connectivity that's recognized as well along things like, it, it, for example, at Kilauea where uh, the connectivity between the summit and the Lower East Rift Zone is well established. We can also, in many cases, see evidence of lateral magma transport in the geologic record. Um, in particular, this is uh, often seen in sedimentary sections. So here's an example um, from a large igneous province. This is the Farrar Large Igneous Province in Antarctica. And you can literally see the transport pathways as magma works its way through dikes and sills into the layered country rock. And this sort of transport can occur on very large scales on the order of tens to hundreds of kilometers or more. And um, the suggestion is that this magma transport, especially when considering more mafic magmas at shallow levels, that these may be fed by sources that are offset by hundreds of kilometers or more from their eruptive centers. So in a nutshell, kind of on the left, we have the, the bottom up approach where where you generate it is where it erupts versus on the right uh, is this sort of idea with perhaps offset feeder zones and very laterally extensive transport. So I'm gonna next focus on the Cascade Magmatic Arc, but first I wanna do just sort of a, a very brief interlude on MT. And I'd encourage you if you're interested in learning more about MT and how it works uh, to look up a previous IRIS webinar that Martin Unsworth gave uh, on sort of an introduction to magnetotelurics. So um, in a nutshell though, MT is a geophysical technique used to constrain electrical resistivity at crustal and lithospheric scales. And we do this by measuring electric and magnetic field variations at the Earth's surface. And from those data, we estimate what are termed impedance and tipper. These are transfer functions that describe how electrical currents flow in the Earth. And we can sort of visualize these data in a number of ways, and we'll do that a little bit later on, but we can also invert them to generate 3D models of electrical resistivity. And that's a lot of what I'll focus on. And then just a couple of points to, you know, kind of keep in mind as we're looking at these resistivity models is that resistivity varies by orders of magnitude within the Earth. And that in general, resistive areas are often found in inactive tectonic regimes, and they often correspond to sort of cold, unaltered, or unmineralized materials. In contrast, conductive regions are much more commonly found in active tectonic domains, and they can be attributed to a number of um, different uh, causes, uh, aqueous fluids, partial melt, uh, clays in the near surface, and then there's also some mineralogic uh, uh, origins of high conductivity, such as metallic sulfides and graphite. So with that in mind, <coughs> excuse me, um, let's now take a look at the tectonic backdrop drop to the Cascade Arc. So shown on the left here is sort of the Western US, and we can see the Juan de Fuca plate subducting beneath the Western North American margin here. And in orange here, this is the Cascade Magmatic Arc, sitting at slab depths of about 80 to 90 kilometers. And I want to draw your attention also to this black line that I'm tracing out here. This is the strontium 706 line and it basically separates everything from, to the west of there, which has been accreted onto North America from sort of the, the core of uh, stable North America. And so the point is that the current cascade arc is sitting on top of this sort of accreted collage. And on the right, we're looking at um, the latest piece of the puzzle to, to join on, which is the Sletz terrain or Sletzia. And all these red areas here are where we have exposures of this. So Sletzia is a large igneous province that was forming in the early Eocene offshore and joined on to the North American margin shortly thereafter. And the other thing to point out is that relative to the modern arc, uh, the exposures of Sletzia kind of are, are all to the west of the arc, but we don't really know where that suture is between Silesia and the Mesozoic North American margin. So let's zoom in a little bit and look at the broader subduction system along the Cascadia margin. So 
shown here are two resistivity cross sections from a recent compilation by Phil Wanamaker and others. And we're looking at sort of these two profiles shown here in black. And these are kind of bounding this area that I've circled here, which is what I'm gonna call the volcanic triangle. And we're gonna keep coming back to this, but you have Mount Rainier in the North, St. Helens to the Southwest and Adams to the Southeast. So we have the cafe line to the North of here and the Ems lab line to the South of there. And there's a number of things that we can see in here that sort of set the stage. So the first thing is we have this large resistor region, which is the subducting Juan de Fuca plate. Above that within the four arc, so the arc is here denoted by these red triangles, Mount Rainier and Mount Jefferson. But in the four arc in the overriding plate, we have another resistor region here and here. And this is the Sletz large igneous province. Um, other things we see off here in the back arc, this is the Mesozoic North American margin. And then we can also look at some of the more conductive regions. And if we start at the shallow slab, we see there's a conductor here, conductor here. These are attributed to, in some cases, sediments being pulled down the trench and dewatering of these sediments. There's a deeper conductive body here and here, which is the interpreted as the release of dehydration fluids. And there's good correlation as well with these conductors and deep long period earthquakes, and low frequency events as well. And then you see sort of these conductors that are kind of coming up towards the arc. And uh, we're not gonna talk much about these, but note that this one here comes up just to the west of Mount Rainier. And the shallow part of this has been interpreted as an offset uh, zone of magma storage. So what's so special about Mount St. Helens? And there's really three things, but we're gonna take these in order. So the first is its location. The magmatic arc is traditionally defined at about 80 to 85 kilometers depth, uh, slab depth. And that's sort of that white dashed line which connects Goat Rocks and Mount Adams there. What we see, however, is that several of the volcanic centers in this area are offset into the four arc. A small amount for Mount Rainier and, and Indian Heaven, and Indian Heaven for reference is a, it's a monogenetic basalt field, um, but also active in the Quaternary. And then Mount St. Helens is really the one that's kind of sitting way out here. It's at a slab depth of about 65 kilometers. So it's somewhat unusual in this regard. And it's also worth noting that there are these two linear zones of seismicity here. This is the Mount St. Helens seismic zone, and this is the West Rainier seismic zone. And these have been known for quite some time in as far back as the mid eighties, it's been postulated that uh, the St. Helens seismic zone may be a zone of localized extension and may have a role in controlling the location of St. Helens. But there've been a variety of uh, explanations for why St. Helens sits where it is. And some of them focus on, uh, if you will, blaming the underlying slab and advocate that there are tears or holes in that slab. We're gonna take a somewhat different tack on that. So the other reason that location matters is the location of St. Helens makes it hard to actually understand how we get melt into the system. So I've got kind of a cartoon schematic here that I flipped on its end so that sort of subduction is going from left to right here as we see in the cascades. But in the traditional main arc, it's being fed by fluids coming off the slab that are fluxing the melting of peridotite within the hot part of the mantle wedge, leading to the voluminous magmatism that we see. In contrast, St. Helens is sitting more in the far arc, and it's sitting over this cold mantle wedge where the temperatures are simply not high enough to generate melts. So this is you know, kind of a first order issue that uh, has been perplexed, has perplexes people for some time now, and it's actually even worse if you consider that there are additional volcanic centers such as the boring lava fields that are sitting out here at even shallower slab depths. So another reason St. Helens is somewhat unusual is its activity. So shown here is uh, a little cartoon of activity of the Cascade, main Cascade volcanoes during the last 4,000 years. And St. Helens is far and away the most active volcano in the system. So understanding what controls this unusual degree of activity is also an open question. And finally, 
Um, St. Helens is a somewhat unusual in terms of its composition. So this is a, a map showing quaternary volcanic vents. And so the main arc is kind of traced right through here with Goat Rocks, Adams, Mount Hood. And then St. Helens is sitting again off here in the fore arc, but the black dots are basalt and andesite and the pluses are dacite and rhyolite. So these more evolved vents seem to be clustered here around St. Helens. And there's a few of them up kind of in the north near uh, Mount Rainier. But, um, you know, there's, there's this sort of question as to why we see these more evolved compositions sitting around St. Helens. And this is what it erupts, it's predominantly erupted over the last 300,000 years. That said, <clears throat> though St. Helens predominantly ge generates dacite, we do also see mafic end members erupting at the volcano, which has led to this rather complex picture on the left of how we can tap multiple reservoirs through the same vent um, for these very petrologically distinct magmas. On the right, we're looking at sort of a, perhaps a current view of the day site generation in which we have this lower crustal reservoir, which is being recharged by wet arc basalts. And in this model, uh, the day sites form within this sort of deep crustal source region, which has both this axial fast lane permitting this periodic eruptions of basalt and andesite, but it's encased within sort of this cooler marginal mush zone where the rhyolites and dacites melts can incubate and then periodically ascend to a shallower storage reservoir prior to their eruption. And this uh, shallower storage reservoir at St. Helens is relatively well uh, understood. Um, the depiction of it is typically as sort of a bottle shaped uh, zone from about five to 15 kilometers depth. And it's been imaged pretty well through seismicity during both the 1980 eruptive sequence and the 2004 eruptive sequence. We also have geophysical imaging, both seismic and magnetotelluric. And shown here on the left is a magnetotelluric image from some of Graham Hill's work at St. Helens. And what you see is this strong conductor, again, kind of in about the five to 15 kilometer range. Uh, very similar to kind of our petrologic view of that upper magma reservoir. So now I'd like to turn to uh, what's termed the Southern Washington Cascades Conductor or SWCC. And this has been a feature that has um, been the source of some debate within the Magnetotelluric community for really a number, several decades now. And it was first identified in uh, 1980 by some magnetovariational data. And without going into too much detail on that, on the left, you see our volcanic triangle here, and then you see these vectors. And these vectors are a way to visualize these tipper data that I alluded to earlier. And what you need to know is that these vectors will point towards regions of high conductivity. And in this case, you see that the vectors are pointing inward on themselves within this triangle. So this suggests that there's a zone of anomalous conductivity in here. Now, some early MT imaging by Dal Stanley in the late 80s and early 90s argued that this conductor actually comes to the surface in a series of anticlines where we have Eocene sedimentary rocks, in particular marine shales, exposed. And that this unit comes to the surface again in some areas, but then sort of dips off to the east and pretty much forms the boundary between Silesia in the west and Mesozoic North America in the east. Uh, subsequent studies by uh, Gary Egbert and John Booker uh, mapped out sort of the broad extent of this SWCC using small magnetometer arrays and showed that it again roughly sits in this volcanic triangle, but that there was also this sort of uh, arm that stretched north-south beyond it to the west of Mount Rainier. And probably the most recent study was um, the uh, empty study I alluded to by Graham Hill, which in addition to having a tight network around St. Helens had a profile that went out beyond Mount Adams. And they came up with this image in the lower right here and argued that this broad zone of high conductivity in the lower crust was potentially uh, a region of lower crustal melt that may be feeding multiple volcanic centers. So you can imagine that the diverse interpretations for this conductor 
have very different tectonic implications. And the SWCC uh, retains its character to this day. We see it in regional models as well. So these are two models from EarthScope transportable array data. So um, the IMUSH experiment was actually one of the first projects funded under the NSF Geoprisms program and included seismology, magnetotelurics, and petrology. And the discussion I had previously on petrology kind of summarizes some of the findings uh, from IMUSH on that. But um, the seismic component included both active and passive experiments. And there've been a range of studies that have come out of these data looking at body and shear wave tomography, ambient noise tomography, receiver functions. And these studies have had you know, a number of uh, <clears throat> really exciting results, including on the upper left here, sort of a change in reflectivity across the MOHO, which is interpreted to uh, indicate hydration of the mantle wedge, uh, renewed constraints on the configuration of the subducting slab, showing that it's continuous at least as far as St. Helens, and that the depth to the slab at St. Helens is about 68 kilometers. There's been the identification of high velocity zones beneath both St. Helens and Indian Heaven, interpreted as potentially cumulates in the deep crust. Refinements on the um, geometry of this shallow magma chamber, as well as some of the surrounding plutonic rocks. And then investigations, which really have sort of showed the first order crustal picture in going from Celestia in the west to the Mesozoic North American margin in the east. So we're, of course, going to be looking at the magnetotelluric component. And we'll start by just getting oriented again. Rainier, Adams, St. Helens, Indian Heaven is sitting down here, and this is Goat Rocks. And so the black dots that you're now looking at show the work of Dal Stanley and others. And unfortunately, these data have not been uh, available in digital form. But what we do have available is a number of other surveys, which I think this survey, this study is really built upon. And I, I want to just highlight the, the importance of, of making sure that these data sets are archived and made publicly available. So we have the CAFE line, which we looked at a section of already up in the north. We have Graham Hill study in blue here. Uh, we have a couple of smaller studies done by uh, Jared Peacock for geothermal exploration or uh, investigations. And then there's a small number of sites as well from the uh, MOCA array and the EarthScope transportable array. So the IMUSH effort itself actually took place. No, that was supposed to be a movie, sorry. Well, forget the movie. Um, the IMUSH effort took place over two extended field seasons during which 145 stations were collected. And nearly all of these stations were full five component data, which means we have excellent tipper data and these become critical to the model we generate. Um, this work involved really a, a huge cast of characters, more than a thousand holes dug, many, many a flat tire, lots of hiking, but some pretty spectacular scenery along the way. So um, this is just a before and after. So now all the white dots that you see on the right are the, um, the results of the IMOS array. So I wanna just talk a little bit about the complexity that's evident in the data itself. So I mentioned that we estimate both these impedances, this, that should, uh, we typically refer to as Z and tippers as T. And we can visualize these as ellipses in the case of the impedance data and vectors in the case of the tipper data. So the vectors are pretty much exactly what we saw uh, in that previous image. And remember that they point towards regions of high conductivity. The ellipses that you're showing seen here, these are termed phase tensors. And what I want to point out is that the more red these are, it indicates that you're going into regions of higher conductivity. So there's two zones I want to point out. First of all, the left image here is um, really giving you information about shallow crustal structure, while the image on the right is giving you information about lower crustal structure. And so you see this area here that I'm highlighting 
and another area here where all the vectors are sort of radiating outward and away from it. And they're pointing towards these areas where we have these red ellipses, indicating again, high conductivity. In the lower crust, it's more this north-south swath. And we pretty much see all these red ellipses, indicating again, high conductivity, and then vectors pointing at it from either side. So we'll see some of these same observations come out when we look at the model. So um, a few notes on the inversion we're doing. The inversion is done using the MODIM algorithm. Uh, we have a one kilometer horizontal, horizontal cell size, and we're inverting about 300 sites, inverting the full impedance as well as tipper data. We uh, have relatively tight error floors on the order of 4% and 0 0.03 in the tipper. And then I'll talk a little bit along the way about some of the tests of model structure. And just a note on the inversion approach, we're using a sequential inversion approach where we start by inverting just the impedance data, giving rise to the model we see in this left stripe. This is then fed into an inversion of the tipper data. And so you'll start to see some of these elongate conductive features develop. And that in turn is fed into an inversion of both impedance and tipper data. And along the way, we sort of are, are progressing by reducing the error floors as well as changing the model covariance to build increasingly finer scale structure into the model. Finally, a model is only as good as its data fit. So just a slide to show you that we actually do fit our data. In the upper left, uh, you're looking at the RMS misfit per station. In the lower left, as a function of period or frequency. And then on the right-hand column here, we're looking as a function of the component of the impedance and tipper that we're fitting. And the final model has a misfit of a little over two, which represents a about a 90% reduction in misfit relative to the starting model. So let's dive into the model itself, shown here as the depth slice at three kilometers. And we're gonna start here by looking at this linear conductor here. So we have this north-south, very strong high conductivity region. This is less than one ohm meter in terms of its resistivity. And we also see some scraps of high conductivity here and off on the eastern side. And what I want to point out here is the, are these black outlines. These are the outlines of those Eocene sedimentary rocks that Dal Stanley originally interpreted the SWCC to. And we can see that in the north, there is a very good correlation with them, as well as some of these sort of satellite regions. In white are Miocene intrusive rocks, which correlate quite well with the resistive parts of this shallow model. In particular here, right next to Mount St. Helens is the Spirit Lake Pluton. We also have the Silver Star Pluton, the Spud Mountain Pluton, and the Tatouche Pluton, which sits beneath Mount Rainier. So we have this very strong correlation between the surface geology and the shallow resistivity model. When we go a little bit deeper into the model, things really, I think, come into focus. And if I can just draw your attention to this nice ring that we see here. There are very few geologic phenomena which produce rings uh, on these sort of scales. And so given our previous association between the resistive zone and the spirit lake pluton, we make the um, assertion that the pluton should actually be upgraded to a batholith. And so this is what we now refer to as the spirit lake batholith. It's more than 2,000 square kilometers in area, but it's comparable in both its age and its size to the Snoqualmie batholith, which sits about 100 kilometers to the north of this model section. And we, again, we see this conductive ring around it. So the conductive ring with the arm going to the north pretty much traces out these Eocene sedimentary rocks. And there's also a nice correlation between the two seismic bands. So the, again, the St. Helens seismic zone and the West Rainier seismic zone fall right on top of these two bands, suggesting that these metasedimentary belts may in some way be controlling the deformation in the region and perhaps altering the local stress state. 
the other thing that are, is on this image are the quaternary vents and they're colored by composition. So in pink are the andesites and basalts and the few that you see in white here are the more evolved day sites, which again, cluster around Mount St. Helens. There's also a few that sort of sit up here as well as a little bit off to the east of Mount Rainier. And there seems to, at least around St. Helens, be an association with those more felsic vents and the location of this conductive belt. There's support for um, the previous interpretation as well by looking at magnetic potential data. And I think this really highlights that St. Helens sits right at the edge of this major crustal suture. So off to the west here, we have these high magnetic potential regions which suggest high magnetization within the Silet's large igneous province. And that's in contrast to what we see off in the east in the Mesozoic section. And these pink outlines are where we actually have exposed Mesozoic rock. So we know that we're in the Mesozoic here, we have Eocene, Silet's here, and that somewhere in between we have to draw the boundary. And this white dashed line is where we have interpreted that boundary to fall. But what you also see is this nice little ovoid shaped high in the magnetic potential surrounded by a low. So this high would be associated with the granite diorites of the Spirit Lake Batholith and the low of the low magnetization rocks of this, uh, these metasedimentary rocks. Finally, I wanna point out that we have deep long period earthquakes also along these same two regions west of Mount Rainier and directly beneath St. Helens. And so these events are typically interpreted in terms of the pumping of magmatic fluids at deep crustal levels. So this again is giving us some indication that uh, there is an interplay between the existence of these deep metasedimentary belts and uh, the ascent of magmas through the crust. We can also look uh, deeper into the crust. So now we're in the lower crust. And what we see here is that there's this north-south conductive swath that is running uh, through the center of our model. And this is actually part of a broader conductive band that runs beneath the entire cascade magmatic arc. And while I'll go through a little bit more on this, the interpretation is that this is reflecting a small amount of interconnected uh, partial melt within a broader mush zone. So if we look at this um, a little bit, um, we see that there's sort of these two bullseyes, one to the east of St. Helens and one beneath Rainier. But what this is really reflecting is the, um, our ability to see through the near surface conductivity. So effectively, these two regions are where we're sitting right beneath the Spirit Lake Batholith and the Tatouche Pluton, and it gives us our best windows into the lower crust. So let's loop back to the SWCC a little bit, given this new model. And what you're looking at here is uh, an image showing crustal conductance or the integrated conductivity throughout the crustal column. And you see this kind of very strange pattern. We see that ring we were looking at before, the north-south belt going past Rainier, but then these blobs in the center. What we can do though, is we can break this out and we can look at both the upper crust. So if we just look at the upper 16 kilometers, now we see the ring and the band. So this is looking at these interpreted metasedimentary belts. And then if we look deeper in the lower crust, we just pick up kind of this north-south trend, again, showing up kind of spotty because of the screening from the conductivity above it. But the point is that these two conductors are vertically separable. And furthermore, if you look back at the upper crustal one, conductance is an order of magnitude higher. So it suggests that the conductivity mechanisms for these are quite distinct. And in terms of the SWCC, I think it sort of puts to rest some of the debate over the origin of this conductor. And the reality is it's a composite conductor and both camps are effectively correct. So turning a little bit now to uh, our ability to resolve this model, um, shown here is the result of a synthetic inversion in which we took the primary features from the model, here the conductive ring and this north-south swath in the lower crust, and 
used it to generate synthetic data given the exact array geometry we had, and then inverted that to see how well we can resolve structure. And what you see is that to first order, we do a pretty good job. The conductive ring has a little bit of a bite taken out of it due to lack of station coverage to the east of Mount Adams, but we can get the overall picture quite well. And even in the lower crust, we still pick up this broad conductive zone that is bulging out to the west a little bit. It's obviously a much more diffuse picture. The other thing we'd like to do is we'd like to get a better control on the actual conductivity of this lower crustal conductor. You recall that this conductor extends fully along the cascade arc and has been attributed to melt. So to get more quantitative estimates, we wanna nail down the bulk conductivity in the model. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna basically do a forward modeling study where we're gonna modify conductivity in this region. Again, this is where we have this best window into the lower crust. And we're gonna see how the misfit to the data changes. So this black to white plot is going to show you the change in misfit as we modify this model. So we can start by replacing that region with a 10 ohm meter uh, zone. And what you see is most of the dots are black. The misfit does not elevate considerably. But as we go more conductive, you start to pick up higher misfits near the west edge of it, progressively higher. And by the time you go to one ohm meter, you're really having considerably increase in misfit. We can also go the other way, looking more resistive. And as we go from 20 to 50 to 100 ohm meters, you again see the misfits start to really rise up. So we can summarize this in sort of a plot of the global misfit as a function of lower crustal conductivity. And we can kind of arrive at a, if you will, a sweet spot here where the model suggests that the lower crustal conductivity is on the order of five to 15 ohm meters. We can then combine this with estimates of uh, silica water content from petrology, as well as PT conditions based on its geometry. And we estimate that on the order of three to 10% interconnected melt is sufficient to explain the conductivity in the lower crust beneath this region. And this is very much in line with um, some of the previous estimates that have been made for this, this region. So um, putting it all together here, we argue that, so if I back up for a second, on the left here is a perspective of the actual resistivity model. And on the right is sort of our cartoon interpretation of it. So we would argue that we have this deep crustal magmatic mush zone, again, with three to 10% melt that is fed by mantle derived hydrous melts. That is in this zone is running along the entire length of the cascade arc. These melts are progressively differentiating and ascending up to or within the crust to mid crustal levels. And then the less viscous mafic melts are able to ascend directly up to form the main arc as well as things like Indian heaven. In contrast, the more silicic melts will either stall within the crustal column or they preferentially ascend along these metasedimentary belts, along the St. Helen seismic zone and the West Rainier seismic zone, where changes in the local stress field due to this inherited crustal structure really facilitate the ascent of these more viscous melts. And finally, given the evidence for a cold mantle wedge sitting beneath Mount St. Helens, there must be some degree of westward lateral transport of melt in order to feed the St. Helens system. In terms of the, the evolution of this system, we can kind of look at this in cartoon form where at the early Eocene, we had silets sort of slamming into the North American margin and that Originally, these, there were passive margin sediments that um, were wedged within the suture between these zones. And this is basically our metasedimentary rocks. So this is our first kind of inherited structure. Uh, once the lets docked on, subduction moved outboard to the western edge of it. And in the mid-Miocene, subduction generated a um, 
there was voluminous magnetism possibly associated with a change in plate motion that emplaced things like the Spirit Lake batholith, the Tatouche Pluton, the Snoqualmie batholith. So this is a second sort of inherited structure that is now embedded in the system. And then we enter the modern day where we have fluids released from the slab into the hot mantle wedge, generating a variety of melts, the more mafic ones coming up along the main axis and the more felsic ones being transported through these metasedimentary belts. Um, this is a movie which is also apparently not going to play. Um, so this is a bit of a perspective view through of the system, but um, what you're looking at is the most conductive bits of the model in red. You can see this linear stripe coming up to the west of Mount Rainier, wrapping around the east edge of the Spirit Lake Batholith here in blue, and then some of these other plutons, the Spud Mountain and the Silver Star Pluton off to the west, as well as a little hints of the Tatouche Pluton to the east of Mount Rainier. So I'd like to finish by just thinking a little bit about some of the implications of this. In particular, um, I think this model tells us a lot about the role of inherited crustal structure and its impact on the local stress regime, as well as I think is a pretty strong argument for lateral melt transport on really you know, pretty large crustal scales. And this is not the only example of this. There's, there's a couple of examples I'd like to just highlight here. This is an example from an MT study done uh, over the Kirishima volcano group in Japan. And the authors argue that there are really sort of two magmatic systems. There's a more silicic body in the upper crust, which is pretty closely aligned with the actual volcano volcanic edifices, but then offset from it is um, a less evolved basaltic magma chamber uh, at deeper depths. And this is shown in the MT model. These are three depth slices from shallow to deep. We can see again, the shallow sort of system close to the volcano, to the actual edifice. And then at depth is one offset to the west. Another nice example is actually was just published. Um, this is by Darcy Cordell and others from Laguna del Male, which is a large arc volcano in Argentina that is the source of a number of very young rye-like flows that you can really see kind of spectacularly in this image here on the left. Um, but the region basically of near this lake has been undergoing pronounced inflation at the rate of 300 millimeters per year. Um, so this has been a, you know, quite a lot of interest. There's also been a seismic low velocity body that lies beneath the lake. So there's, number of suggestions that there is a relatively evolved rhyolitic system beneath this area that has been inflating. Now the empty image on the right shows a somewhat different picture. We see this deep conductive zone that is offset to the north from the actual inflation center, but it has sort of this finger that appears to be rising towards it. But what's most noticeable is the lack of a conductor beneath the inflationary center. And they've done a number of tests to really try to understand this, but I think what it implies is that at best there is a highly crystalline mush with very little interstitial felsic melt. So it doesn't show up as a conductor. And I think this is consistent with kind of the petrologic view that these systems spend most of their time, most of their lifetime in sort of cold storage. And it's only over sort of brief periods of time that they become eruptable. And again, this sort of idea of these offset magmatic systems, um, there's, there's evidence elsewhere. There's a study that's ongoing uh, looking at the magmatic system in Antarctica between, beneath Mount Erebus, and it, it shows sort of a similar uh, offset magmatic system. So how common are these sorts of offset reservoirs? Shown here is uh, results of a recent compilation that looked at about 60 arc volcanoes. And without going into too much detail, what they found is that about 20% of them had a magmatic system. This is a geophysically imaged magmatic system that appears to be offset from the edifice. And they make the argument that these offset systems are often common in sort of younger systems or systems with low magmatic flux, such that magma can effectively be captured by pre-existing structures and focused within the crustal column. In contrast, 
as the system becomes more long-lived or with a higher magmatic flux, it starts to thermally overprint the crust, leading to a more vertical sort of bottom-up type of system. So together, I think we're getting an emerging picture of magma as an opportunist, which is effectively exploiting past structures to its advantage. And this is sort of hammered home to me by a couple of studies that have looked at silicic calderas in different tectonic settings. First, in the, uh, in the upper left, there was a study by Hughes and Mahood, which cataloged silicic arc calderas, which are essentially the high flux end members of what we see at St. Helens. And they found that the nature of the underlying crust has a very profound impact on the size of the caldera. They also found that silicic calderas are sort of spread out over a much wider region than the typical arc volcanoes, which tend to fall in a straight line. And most importantly, they, they noted that many of the calderas were associated with pre-existing structures that tend to favor magma chamber growth and evolution. And the second study, which is shown here on the right, uh, was in a totally different tectonic environment, but this is within the East African rift system. And they looked at the orientation of elliptical silicic calderas and their relation to pre-existing structures. And what they found is there was very strong alignment between the two. And since the geometry of the magma reservoir is believed to be preserved in the geometry of the caldera, they argue then that these pre-existing structures control the ascent and development of these magma reservoirs. So uh, just a couple of conclusions here in terms of structure. Uh, the Spirit Lake Pluton, we've, we've upgraded it to the Spirit Lake Batholith. The, uh, in the upper crust, we see these deep-seated metasedimentary rocks that surround the Spirit Lake Batholith and the neighboring Pluton, Plutons. And these rocks are believed to, to really mark the, the boundary between Silesia and the Mesozoic edge of North America. And then we have this lower crustal conductor, which again is consistent with the deep mush zone containing three to 10% interconnected melt. And then the inboard edge of Silesia again lies directly beneath St. Helens, but a little bit to the west of Mount Rainier. And from a process perspective, I'd argue that inherited structures really act as a magmatic filter and can, can significantly impact the location and composition of the erupted material. That lateral melt transport at St. Helens is actually required in order to feed this off-axis eruptive center. And that more generally in these arc environments, deep-seated structures can alter the local stress field facilitating the ascent and eruption of these really thick magmas that may otherwise just stall in the crust. And so finally, I, I think we've shown that there's a really strong role for top-down control on magma transport and storage. And in some cases, this may better explain off-axis volcanism than variations in slab geometry. So just to, as a closing note here, the resistivity model is available at the IRS Earth Model Collaboration and the data are available on the USGS Science Space. And lastly, um, this again is the result of a lot of effort on a lot of fronts. And I really wanna thank all the people who uh, really were instrumental to making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so we have a couple questions already submitted. Um, we'll give people some additional time to file those in. And uh, while they're doing that, I will uh, share my screen for a moment and uh, share some slides uh, just to give a quick status update on the uh, development of the MT facility associated with uh, the SAGE program. So uh, just to uh, just to highlight uh, where this is occurring, this is at the uh, pa Iris Pascal Instrument Center that is in uh, that is affiliated with the uh, New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology in Socorro, New Mexico. That's about an hour south of Albuquerque. Uh, the PIC has been around for uh, almost uh, almost 25 years at this point, and it's um, supported over a thousand individual experiments, mostly seismic deployments, but it was the recommendation of the uh, US geophysical science community uh, to 
uh, build up a capacity for MT research to be uh, facilitated out of the PIC, in part to um, benefit from the PIC's expertise in a lot of uh, different logistical avenues and technical avenues, as well as encouraging uh, multimodal, multimodal or joint seismic MT experiments. So this was work that was funded by NSF uh, a couple years ago. We're in the midst of a five-year award uh, to set that up. And we're making progress towards that. So we have new instrumentation that's coming in-house uh, within, the, within the next month. Those are long period MT systems, the LEMI 424. Um, those are uh, comprised of a data logger uh, and uh, a three component flux gate magnetometer. The PIC is also building customized uh, deployment boxes for ease of use so that PIs can uh, really focus on uh, their site selection criteria. And when they get on site, they can uh, efficiently deploy the instrument for as long as it needs to be out. We've also uh, uh, procured 50, uh, 50 electrodes. These are boron lead chloride electrodes. Uh, they were uh, selected after a competitive uh, lab and field test evaluation with uh, several other uh, types of chemistries and uh, uh, makes of electrode and they were sort of the best overall option. And then uh, we're in the final stages of evaluating and testing uh, several different types of commercially available wideband MT systems. And so these will be instruments that can support a wide variety of potential um, science applications. And we're uh, on deck to finish that evaluation in the next month or so. We'll be purchasing uh, approximately four uh, by mid-2021. And then uh, just with our uh, remaining award funds, at least 14 more over the next two years. So we're hoping to have a pool uh, at the end of this current award from NSF of over 30 MT systems uh, for PI use. In addition, we're investing resources in um, developing more robust data flows and software resources for MT science. So uh, for archiving data, we're, uh, for long period data sets, we're leveraging MiniSeed. That's a, a sort of a very standardized uh, science or seismic format that's been used for MT data sets that were produced during EarthScope, as well as uh, MTML, which is an adaptation of station XML for MT time series metadata. MT transfer functions are already uh, archived in our uh, SAGE Data Management Center data product repository uh, using uh, XML formatting. And uh, we're working towards a future archival format called GeoHDF. Uh, what we're investing additional funds in doing beyond just being able to handle facility data handling are uh, developing a new community standard format for exchangeable MT data called MTH5. And um, that is coupled with a uh, very detailed uh, set of metadata standards to allow for MT data sets to be uh, most useful and broadly discoverable um, uh, in the long, long term. The other half of this effort is uh, creating a modern open source MT data processing workflow. Uh, this will be primarily a modularized rewrite of Gary Egbert's EMTF data processing code and some of the supporting tools with that. So this will be read written into Python uh, and will include some of the uh, array management and visualization tools that help uh, work through uh, large data sets that have been collected uh, in, an, in one or more experiments. Uh, in addition, this uh, will be extensively documented and made open source so that other uh, interested members of the MT community and other communities can uh, add to this over the years. We really wanted to make this a sustainable resource uh, that facilitates a lot of science. Uh, and I should know we're in the process of um, setting up a contract for that work. Uh, in addition, I just want to emphasize that this is an effort that takes a lot of um, uh, a lot of its input from the MT community. So we have uh, the Electromagnetic Advisory Committee is made up of uh, various members of the MT science community that helps uh, guide our decision making and make sure that we're on the right heading. So uh, just to wrap up, what can you expect as a potential facility user? Say you've, you've watched Paul's talk, uh, you've, you've seen other examples of MT science and you're interested in, in getting involved uh, and you haven't done this yet or used the SAGE facility yet. So 
Instruments should be uh, widely available to PIs for use by early to mid 2021. Uh, as I mentioned, the long period instruments are coming in any day now, and then we'll have to procure and uh, receive wideband instruments. And it takes a little bit of time to get resources in place, but um, it's uh, getting close. And the PIC itself provides equipment training, software demonstrations, logistical support for experiments, and uh, uh, additional forms of aid available to PIs at no cost. That's that's uh, already provided by NSF in the maintenance of the IRIS operated facilities. So really, if you you can come in as a PI and uh, be given a significant amount of assistance to make your experiment happen. Uh, the PIC also provides data flow support in terms of fulfilling uh, the requirements that often come with funding for uh, public data archival. And uh, as I mentioned, there are new resources being developed and put into place that will be finalized in 2021. Uh, the data processing software should be available by late 2021. And uh, the PIC instruments themselves, they are prioritized for US researchers, but uh, as we've seen over the uh, pr preceding decades, the seismic equipment that's been available to PIC has been used and leveraged for a lot of international collaborations and joint science that's not bound to borders or uh, geography. So what can you do next? If you're, if you're interested in learning more, uh, there's a, 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 a mailing list that you can sign up for. If you're a potential PI, either to NSF or some other uh, funding agency within the US, I really encourage you to submit proposals or supplement requests to uh, bank on the fact that we will have these instruments and that they can be used for future science plans. Uh, we're looking forward at doing additional webinars. There is uh, one in January 21 that's scheduled for Antarctic MT that will be given by Phil Wanamaker. And other suggestions are welcome. Uh, we're certainly uh, interested in making uh, or selecting topics that will be uh, broadly recognized as uh, useful. And um, we're planning on doing a field and data processing short course. This is something that we were originally targeting uh, late spring, early summer. Obviously, unfortunately, uh, COVID's, uh, the COVID pandemic has changed our plans, but we still have those funds. And so once it's safe to do so, we really would like to uh, have uh, an opportunity to get together potential interested users uh, to uh, use the instruments in person. Uh, have an opportunity to learn about some of the data processing tools and really spin up uh, a new generation of uh, MT principal investigators within the US. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll stop my share. And uh, Paul, I have uh, at least seven questions that have been uh, accumulated that I can uh, start running through. And, um, and you're welcome to share your screen again if you need to use that uh, in answering them. Sure. So, uh, so to start, uh, first questions from uh, George Jerasek, and George asks, um, do clay-rich metasediments still foil MT geothermal exploration? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, as you, George, know, I am not in the geothermal exploration business, but um, you know, just the physics of the problem of if you have these clay-rich layers. Um, within the near surface, they are always going to, to some degree, hinder your ability to see through to what you're interested in below it. In the case of geothermal, often this would be a, a somewhat more resistive uh, uh, potential reservoir. So yeah, I don't think the physics of the problem has changed. Um, you know, I'd also maybe draw a distinction between uh, you know, sort of how we define the words metasediments. Um, in the area which I'm, uh, you know, was looking at here, surrounding the Spare Lake Bathlet, those conductive metasedimentary belts are actually pretty high metamorphic grade. Um, they are locally actually amphibolite grade. So that's a very different situation than sort of a maybe a clay alteration cap that you would see on top of a geothermal system. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, next question is from Adam Schultz, and Adam asks: For Laguna del Male, uh, can dry rhyolitic upper melt, uppermost crustal magma accumulation be discounted? Um, Adam adds: At Newberry, uh, we see that the size we see that the seismic magma body beneath the caldera has no associated conductivity signature, and the interpretation there, factoring in was one is known 
about from the control gene geochemistry is for dry rhyolite melt that offers no conductivity contrast to the rhyolite host rock. Yeah, um, well, that's a, that's a good question. I think what Adam is hitting at is, um, you know, kind of, we're starting to see an increasing number of cases where there is geophysical evidence that we really should have a magmatic system, an active magmatic system in an area, but uh, MT is not seeing a conductor. And I think the Laguna del Male example um, is a really interesting case. Um, on these more silicic um, melt systems, rhyolite melts are not necessarily very conductive. They can be, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, tens to 100 ohm meters. So um, there's differences in terms of the conductivity of the melt. Um, and then again, when we get down to these sort of low melt fractions, you start to lose connectivity. And so I think understanding in which situations uh, you can discount melt based off of the conductivity model versus which other cases where maybe it is still consistent with melt. And I think in the case of Laguna del Male, there's, there's seems to be considerable evidence that, uh, you know, from the, from the deformation there, which is just screaming uh, and the low velocity bodies that you most likely have, you know, some degree of, of melt in that system, but it's just perhaps not conductive enough to show up relative to the surrounding country rock. Thanks, Paul. Um, so next question is from Glenn Mattioli and Glenn asks, why would the most silicic and therefore most viscous magma be the ones that would migrate farthest off the vertical path to the surface? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I probably am not going to have a good answer for it. Um, but, you know, just thinking about it a little bit um, off the cuff here, um, you know, there's a number of differences between sort of these more silicic melts and their more mafic counterparts. Um, you know, obviously temperature is one, the viscosity is another. Um, and there's issues of magma pressure. I mean, magma is when the earth, basically the ascent of magmas is largely governed by a combination of magma overpressure and their buoyancy. So the buoyancy is going to be different between um, those two types of melts. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that, but um, it, it seems like your more mafic magmas um, have a have a stronger tendency to just um, you know kind of rocket through the crust in a more vertical sense. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not I'm not sure I have a very satisfactory answer for that. Okay, uh, next question is from uh, Jan Avram. And uh, Jan says, uh, great presentation, Paul, thanks. In the near future, can we expect to see some repeat of the Mount St. Helens surveys to eventually see some evolution of these results? Can we expect some changes? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in sort of the monitoring of these systems and, and are there changes in the conductivity structure that are strong enough to be resolved. Um, I know there has been discussion about a, a couple different groups about going back to St. Helens um, and uh, trying to do a repeat of at least sort of the inner part of uh, Graham Hill survey area. Um, I'm not sure that I'm particularly optimistic at St. Helens in part because it appears that the upper crustal reservoir, that five to 15 kilometer reservoir, which is where, I mean, just being close to the surface, it's where MT would have the best sensitivity. That reservoir seems to be relatively stable in terms of the images we're seeing of it now, following the 2004 eruptive episode, it looks very similar to what we saw following the uh, 1980s er eruptive episode. So I'm not sure how confident I would be of seeing considerable changes. It, it, I mean, if it was immediately prior to an eruption when you actually kind of make that transition to eruptable melts, then I would imagine you might see a significant difference. But if we were just taking a snapshot now versus 10 years ago, I'm not sure how much we would see. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, 
Next question is from Steve Malone. And Steve asks, about the best synthesis of all the different data types for IMUSH in the greater southern Washington Cascades I have heard. I would be interested in more of your thoughts on the WRSZ, I think it's that West Rainier Seismic Zone, and the relationship between the persistent seismicity there with possible magmatic transport. Yeah, um, well, thanks, Stephen. That is that is a, a great question. There's, um, so there was a model that was published on the CAFE line um, several years ago by Shane McGarry and others. And I just kind of alluded to that um, they talked about a potentially offset magma, mat, a shallow offset magmatic center um, to the west of Mount Rainier, or sort of, a, sorry, an upper crustal magma storage zone to the west of Rainier. When we kind of look at that in our models, that zone actually, it, that conductor is basically part of the broader West Rainier seismic zone. Um, so I would argue that there possibly is no sort of offset magmatic system at Rainier, or if there is, it's something we can't really differentiate from the high conductivity that we see just due to these metasedimentary belts. Um, so if you, if you were to discount that, then looking just beneath Rainier, there's not really a strong indication of um, kind of a shallow conductor similar to what we see at St. Helens. It, it looks like the edifice is kind of built on top of the uh, Miocene H Tatouche Pluton, and then the whole thing is sitting on top of this lower crustal mush zone. So I'm not sure if there is a, uh, a strong correlation between that um, West Rainier seismic zone and the magmatic system at Rainier. The one thing I will note is there are a couple of day site vents, um, quaternary day site vents that fall either within or right next to that um, West Rainier seismic zone. And I find that to be somewhat interesting in terms of, again, kind of perhaps supporting the idea of structural control on where these more silicic melts um, ascend and erupt. Thanks, Paul. Um, so just a, an informational item, uh, Adam chimed in that uh, to answer Jan's question, there's a proposal from colleagues in Europe to monitor MS Mount St. Helens with 40 MT. Um, so there may be some additional observations in the future. Um, so we have one final question. Uh, other questions are welcome if you wanna uh, get them in now. But um, the last question that we have uh, so far is from Cedar uh, Honison and Cedar asks if multiple volcanic centers are being fed from the same deep mush zone, what do you think controls the variation in eruptive frequency? It, is it also tied to variations in the stress field? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think it is ultimately tied to variations in the stress field, but um, perhaps in a perhaps in a somewhat more complicated fashion. So the more silicic systems that erupt um, are often also higher flux. And so, I mean, to some degree in order to erupt, you need to maintain high enough temperatures in a large enough reservoir um, such that you can, you can get an eruptible melt to the surface. And I do wonder if, you know, if you take sort of the examples here of the the St. Helens seismic zone or the, um, the West Rainier seismic zone, if those are kind of localized zones of extension, if it just allows for smaller batches of magma to uh, ascend um, more frequently and easier through the crustal column and therefore you can accumulate easier an, uh, an eruptable volume. Um, but yeah, I, th I, I guess I, I do think it's ultimately tied to the stress field, but perhaps in a somewhat complex way. 